Welcome back, kitties, to Loathsome Things, a horror movie podcast. Uh, a podcast in which two morons talk about, well, horror movies. And uh, my name is John, in case you didn't already know, Ramon. And uh, his name is Josh. Josh, how are you doing, sir? We Mary Bon God But of course <laughs> I am doing so well it is like all of the skin has been flayed from my body and all of my nerves are exposed to joy. Oh man What the hell? Yeah and yourself John how are you? I'm doing better than I was last week when we were originally supposed to record this. <laughs> I had some sort of weird headache that I often get on Sundays. So I did a Google search to find out what the fuck was up with weekend headaches. And apparently yeah. it's related to a drop in stress hormones that weekly workers have and can be tied in, of course, to diet and caffeine and lack of caffeine and Da 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 da. Yeah. Changing your sleep schedule radically one day of the week and all this shit. But yeah, it was like this, you know, kind of like a migraine, like just really, really painful. And I was just like shivering in the corner at one point. Oh, God. I was so hot. I felt so hot. It wasn't that hot in here. It was like 72. But I felt so hot. I was holding my fan, just like holding it in my face. Like just, and that <laughs> felt like. Felt like relief until it didn't, and then I felt stupid and, you know, went to, <laughs> went to sleep. So mu I'm doing much better now. <laughs> I'm glad. That sounds terrible. I have a similar one. It's not the headache, though. It's just every Sunday I feel sick. Like, I feel like, like, wait a minute. Am I getting COVID right now? Like, <laughs> is everything about to fall apart? But sure enough, Monday morning comes around and everything's fine. <laughs> It's, it's amazing what your horrible body can do to you. <laughs> <laughs> the human body is truly a horrific thing. <laughs> and we will explore that in depth as we talk about 2008's Martyrs, directed by Pascal Logier, who oh, yeah. is a French director, in case you didn't I'll pick up on that. Um... This was his second feature film. Uh, he His first film was called St. Ange. And if I remember yeah. correctly, it was a piece of shit. Uh, oh, after, that, <laughs> after that, he made a little ditty by the name of the ta of Tall Man, I believe, was next. Um, or did well, he make something else? I think he made the Tall Man after this? Oh, yeah, he made Martyrs. I don't know. That's right, he made Martyrs. Yeah, yeah. He made then he made a little film a -roo. He made a little film aru that has uh, basically had a massive impact on horror, and that's the one we're going to discuss, Martyrs. After that, he made yeah. a movie called Tall Man, which was a Hollywood-ish production starring Jessica Biel. Total piece of shit. Um, shit piece. Awful. He followed that up with Incident in a Ghost Land, which yeah. I personally thought was a total piece of shit. Um, yeah. And that's pretty much where we stand with Pascal Logier. He was slated originally to uh, direct the Hellraiser remake as far back as 2009. Yeah. I was reading an interview where he was talking about it. Uh, he removed himself from the project. I don't know why. And of course... Oh, I can tell you. Oh, what was the reason? Okay, so his his experience with the tall man, his conclusion of that was he hated doing American movies because the director was not in absolute control of everything. He wow. didn't like that they had people that had say in different elements of things. So he refused to do the Hellraiser uh, remake and instead made Incident in a Ghost Land where his incompetence as the be-all and end-all of the director who everything is what is the director saying included Taylor Hickson saying hey 
are you sure this glass is safe? Uh, every time I hit it, it feels like it's going to shatter against my flesh. And he said, no, it's safe. Just keep hitting your body into it harder and harder. And every time she did it, it wasn't hard enough for him. So she kept incrementally increasing how hard she busted her body into that glass until it shattered and caused permanent disfigurement to her face because of the injuries she suffered from it sho of shoving her body through not safe glass. Wow. The, yeah, that's great. The territory of Manitoba fined them $40,000. The last I checked, the lawsuits from this are still outstanding. And uh, also, the they ended up deciding to include a little nod to it in the marketing for the movie, where the cover for the movie is a woman's face shattered like glass on the side of the face where Taylor Hickson's face was oh, forever disfigured. That's true, like a broken doll. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. wow. So Pascal can go fuck himself, quite honestly. <laughs> yeah, Jesus Christ. He, uh, <clears throat> apparently the inspiration for Martyrs was he was going through a period of deep depression, suicidal depression, and... On we, perhaps? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, and he, he, uh, had this image, basically, uh, pop into his head of a, and, and by the way, we will be telling the whole story, and if you haven't watched the movie, stop right now and go watch it, because, you know... Yeah, unless, unless you're very squeamish. Let's yes. do a content warning. That's a good point. Torture. Torture, torture, torture. Torture of children. Murder of children. Killing people. Uh, home invasion. Kill the family. Torture people. Horrible body mutilation. Torture, torture, torture. Yes, that's correct. There's lots of torture in this film. In fact, this movie is basically centered around torture. So, uh, yeah. If that's something that makes you uncomfortable, which it should, but makes you yeah. so uncomfortable that you won't get any enjoyment out of the, watching this film, uh, go with that feeling and don't watch this film. You can listen to us describe all of the torture torture, but I will say it's kind of a masterpiece. Like It is, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> it, it is the... It is Spoiler the, alert! It is. It is the 21st century's version of uh, Joan of Arc, kind of, in a sense. Uh, it's, uh, whoa. Yeah, the, the, uh, the concept of martyrs and martyrization and all that. We'll get into that. But this film, as gruesome and, you know, unrelenting as it is, is, uh, in my opinion, a great film. One of the best horror films ever made. Uh it was my probably my favorite horror film up until we discussed Possession, and I just Jesus. suddenly occurred to me that that Possession was near perfection. Um. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, this one this one is up there. Like th this would be a five. Like if we were still doing a loathsome things score, I think this would probably get a ten. Oh, I it, mean, it, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Where would you Where would you dock it? I, I would absolutely give it a five. Um, I mean, it's, it's, uh, like I said, for many years, it's been my favorite horror film. And, uh, y you know, it's, I'm familiar with, you know, French culture and their, their kind of, uh, their kind of pretension and, you know, their, their love of like philo philosophy and stuff like that. And this film taps into a whole bunch of that kind of stuff. Um, so it's a very, it's a very French type of film and if you don't really you know appreciate that kind of weirdness then you know this film is probably just gonna feel like Eli Roth made it or something but whereas I don't know I don't know because it's because I think of like French philosophy as being very pretentious and this feels like it's subverting it this feels almost un-French I think I'm, I'm what I'm referring to more is just the fact that they lay it out as a philosophical message ultimately you know I gotcha. I see what you're talking about. Yeah, not so much that they're, you know, that they're like tapping, like Sartre isn't going to come in and Google-eyed smoke a pipe and talk about ennui, as you were saying. <laughs> I would watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um, the, the, the film uh, stars a couple people whose names I can't pronounce. Um, they are... Uh, <laughs> 
some actors. Uh, yeah, more Jana Aloui. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> and Jabo B Balaba Wapi. Yeah, Mylene J- Jean Panois. I don't know if it's Jean Panois, Jean Panoy. I don't know. I, I yeah, it's uh, they, I don't know if they're. I haven't looked it up, but I'm wondering if they're like Algerian descent or something like that. Um, yeah, let's see. Moroccan? I don't know. Yeah, Mylene Jampanoy. At least that's how we would say it here. And Morjana Alawi. 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 Okay. Um, anyways, yeah, that's, uh, yeah. I don't know if what else they've been in. I didn't look. I probably haven't seen it. They, I haven't really seen either of these women before, which is kind of funny because they're both very striking. They're both... Yes. Know, have very recognizable faces. And one of the things that's funny about this movie is I always kind of felt like they were two sides of the same character. Uh, mm-hmm. they're, they're, I mean, for the longest time, I I replaced one character with the other for the whole ending part of the film and thought that basically all that stuff was Lucy. Like, I completely forgot that it was Anna that it happened to. Damn, dude. So, so... The last time I watched this movie was when we were working together and you recommended it to me. Mm -hmm. And I watched it exactly one time, forgot everything about the movie except the ending. (laughs) And then watched it again and I was like, holy shit! Like, it was all surprises all over again except for the ending. It's, um, it feels incredibly long, obviously, because the subject matter is difficult. But he also... The more I watch it, the more I notice some of the, like, more technical aspects of the film. He, you know, the whole first half of the film is a lot of very close-up, handheld camera shots where the camera is moving a lot, and most of the screen is filmed with the subject that's on camera at that moment. And so there's a lot of, like, just hyperkinetic motion going on with the camera, and it's really disorienting, and it... It's unrelenting, too. So it's like, then you have these still moments of super high tension or emotional release, and it's it's very effective. And then, of course, it, it does a 180, sort of, or it veers off in a off, completely different direction, and which it is very good at doing. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's a, it's a great case study in story arcs, because, like, you can, you, they're, they're I guess, two. There are really three major story arcs that happen in the movie. Yeah. But even those can like be broken up into sub arcs. It's it's very technically proficient and and exemplary. Like it is a great, I'm sure, film school film. Oh yes. It's very filmy. <laughs> it's yeah. definitely yeah, I got that that whole kind of cinephile thing going on. Um I kind of compare it in the way that it it flows to Barbarian, because Barbarian starts out one way and then just completely goes in another direction at a certain point, you know? And this this film yeah. very much does that, more than once, but once that is really shocking, and then once that you maybe saw coming, sort of, but not really, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It would be pretty hard to see certain things coming. Oh, man. It's like, oh, yeah, of course. (laughs) Where else would this movie go? (laughs) Oh, look, it's a picture of an actual person tortured to death. Oh, God. Yeah. Bummer. Yeah, super (laughs) bummer. (laughs) Whee! (laughs) Yeah, yeah. So, so we'll get into it. Is there any other thing we need to do, John, before you you spoil the entire movie for us and ruin it for all of our lovely <laughs> listeners? I can't, I can't think of anything that I that I want to add prior to ruining the entire film. Ruin that movie, baby! <laughs> Rip it down! Oh shit! Okay, so the movie opens on a young girl who is filthy in her underwear, cut up, bruised terrified her hair her hair's all buzzed short she's busted out of a a what looks to be a a slaughterhouse and is running down the wet gross ground away from the place screaming in agony uh she has apparently escaped from some horrible uh, confinement great 
Uh, we cut to a, a what apparently is like an orphanage or something for young girls, and uh, we discover that this girl, her name is Lucy. She was, you know, we learn that she had been abducted and had escaped her abductors who were torturing her. She is nonverbal, uh, at least to everybody, but her friend that she meets in the home, Anna. Anna is kind of her go-between with uh, the really creepy administrators of the facility. Ooh, and yeah. um, basically, we we discover that Lucy is being tormented by some sort of creature that, uh, you know, of which origin we're not really clear, but it's some sort of horrible female f- figure, creature, whatever, that attacks her when no one else is present, you know, like late at night or whatever, and is trying to kill her. And it's it's pretty terrifying. Um, yeah. So, you know, Anna, Anna kind of finds out about this and... <clears throat> then, you know, I mean, I, we don't really know what Anna thinks, if she even believes her or not, but she's, you know, she's there for her friend. So and that's basically that with the hospital. But suddenly we cut to 15 years later, and we we find out, we don't find it right away, but we end up finding out that the, the girls have broken out of this home. And um, Lucy basically is at a really ultra modern house in the middle of the woods somewhere and uh she knocks on the door uh people open the door or the father opens the door and she blows him away with a shotgun (laughs) (laughs) comes into the house and we've we've already seen the family like doing family things and uh, family breakfast yeah they've established that this is just you know your typical middle class suburban french family uh so she's just killed the father she goes in and essentially, she kills the whole family with the shotgun, including two children. Um, yep. And then uh, Anna shows up. They they talk on the phone. Anna shows up and tries to kind of, you know, <laughs> help her clean up the situation. Um, in the meantime, uh, Lucy has once again started being tormented by some sort of ghoulish, hag-like, naked female monster figure that keeps attacking her and slashing her and doing all these horrible things to her. Um, Anna witnesses some of this, which essentially is Lucy cutting herself with a knife. Yep. Uh, so now we, we realize that Lucy is basically imagining things. And we find out that uh, what she's imagining is the girl she left behind when she escaped from the slaughterhouse because she heard the people coming and didn't have time to free her. So the girl's screaming for her to save her, and she gets out and saves herself. So she's tormented by her memory of this girl. Great. So it yeah. feels like a monster movie. Okay, I can get with that. But why did she kill this family? Who can really say? Um, <laughs> she tells Anna that these people, she recognizes these people because the daughter won some swimming competition or something, and her picture was in the paper. Lucy saw this. And she said, you know, she saw the family. This is the family that uh, had originally abducted her and begun this whole torture thing. Uh, of course, Anna thinks she's Looney Tunes, but um, yeah. she is insistent that these are the people. So then there's this big, you know, Lucy's fighting with her monster creature thing, da-da-da. The mother turns out to still be alive. Anna tries to rescue her. All hell breaks loose. Uh, ultimately, Lucy ends up jumping through a giant plate glass window and right in front of Anna, slitting her own throat and dying. So, yeah, Anna buries all the bodies in a plumbing hole in the yard and then goes inside and is in the living room dicking around. And there's like some, some hammer of some sort that she hears. It moves a little bit and then it falls and, and she looks over and there's like a hole behind the this big piece of furniture where the, this ham, hammer has fallen in and knocked some panel out or something. So she she opens the doors to this furniture and discovers there's basically a doorway hidden. She goes in there and, co- you know, basically enters into this weird, like, industrial, you know, Hannibal Lecter-type-looking underground chamber. Sci-fi set. Yeah, it's yeah. just like, what the fuck? <laughs> And it's so jarring because it's you just you're just coming to terms with 
you know, uh, Lucy killing this whole family and, you know, Anna doesn't believe her. And then all of a sudden, now when it's too late, she discovers this chamber under the ground. So she goes down in there and she walks through this hallway and sees these, these uh, illuminated pictures or posters or whatever along the wall of actual people uh, in various stages of torture, basically. And they all, what they all seem to have in common is this weird, like, kind of blissful look on their face where they're staring up at the heavens. So that includes yeah. an infamous photo of a Chinese woman being tortured by Japanese soldiers, uh, which I assume would have been in Nanking. Uh, it's, yeah. a, it's a horrible photograph. It's a famous photograph, but she, she's got that look. So, you know, Anna's obviously like, what the fuck? And then she she goes down even further in this cool like, ladder thing that drops down, and she gets down into this horrible dark chamber and discovers this, this young uh, woman who's completely bound. She has this weird, like, headgear on so she can't see, and she's hysterical, and she's been obviously tortured horribly. Uh, Lucy, I mean, Annie, Anne, <laughs> frees the girl. Yeah. They, they come upstairs, they try to, you know, she's trying to get the girl to calm down, da-da-da. Basically, um, the girl has her head blown off or her body blown through with a shotgun. These pe weird people have arrived, and uh, they clear out all the dead bodies or whatever, and then they take Anna and throw her down in the dungeon and lock her up in the seat with the hole in it and a bucket underneath for shitting and pissing. <laughs> <laughs> so there's still more movie left so now she's down there confined down there she doesn't know what the fuck's going on some woman comes down and feeds her the most disgusting food i've ever seen force feeds oh, her man. and beats her if she doesn't eat it and then this giant bald creepy guy in, in really nice clothes comes down and beats the living shit out of her repeatedly and we see this this cycle happen a few times over uh and then the woman that feeds her comes down. At this point, she's buzzed completely, and she's, like, basically been beaten into submission. She's not even fighting back anymore. And the woman's feeding her. She even reaches up and touches the lady's hand, like, you know, like she's kind of lost it. And the woman says, don't worry, you know, it's your suffering is almost over. And there's we see these two doors. Light comes on in the doors. This guy comes out in... in Black Scrubs was pretty pretty snazzy. Uh, yeah. Picks Anna up, bring, puts her into this apparatus thing that's like this big metal circle with bars all on it, and he straps her in or locks her in with these cuffs and stuff, and then turns, cranks it so she's upright, and he flays her alive. Uh, yeah. Hangs her in this weird Christ-like, <laughs> martyr, get it, <laughs> Uh, pose uh, and uh, and then we go back upstairs basically the 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 woman the blonde woman goes down there to feed her and discovers you know we hear her scream for the dude and they call mademoiselle the lady who is the henchman behind all of this nonsense um, and and they say that she has she has reached the martyrdom point that she has seen the beyond and is still alive and that's this is their goal is to try to reach the great whatever happens after life but they can they believe that they can uh do this with a living person through a series of systematic tortures that ramps up to i guess a flaying and that the goal is that they will see what's on the other side and then be able to relay that uh, before they die, but Anna's the only one that's actually done this. So the lady rushes over, and uh, she goes to see Anna. Anna whispers a bunch of something in the lady's ear, and then all these old people show up at the house in nice cars, and Etienne, the house boy or whatever the fuck he is, <laughs> yeah, comes down the stairs and tells them that you know that they've had this great breakthrough that she's the first one who has actually relayed what happened to her uh, she's in this wonderful she was in this wonderful ecstatic state for this long and then in this time this happened and da 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 they're all there to venerate the martyr um and the, the old lady mademoiselle is going to come out and talk to them 
But before she does, <clears throat> she goes into a bathroom and takes off all her bizarre, cartoonish-looking makeup and fake eyelashes and shit, which I, I'm not sure why she was wearing those in the first place. But she takes all that shit off, sits on the edge of the tub, and has a little chitty chat with uh, Etienne about how, uh, you know, basically she, she says that, you know, it's, it was very clear what she told me, and, you know, she clearly saw what is on the other side, and, you know, she told me blah, 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 she told me this, that, da, 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 and then ultimately she says, keep doubting, <laughs> and then shoots herself in the mouth. And uh, then the movie ends, but we get a little uh, a little title card thing or whatever that says that martyrs uh, is Greek for witness. And then as the credits roll, we see uh, old filmy style shots of Anna. And uh, well, first we see a final shot of Anna laying catatonic in this weird like blue wheat, I guess. I don't, I don't even know. Yeah. And then the... <laughs> Credits roll, and, and we see the two girls playing, you know, back when everything was so innocent and nice, except that Lucy had already been she, tortured. <laughs> yeah. So Just Playing in the dappled sunlight. Yeah, so... And, of course, this is all going to bring up... That's movie over, by the way. That's going to bring up... A, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh. <laughs> we... It's going to bring up a shit ton of questions. Um... It, of course, probably the first question hot on your mind is what did Anna say to Mademoiselle? Um, mm. There's a lot of speculation online, of course. There's a bunch of Reddit bullshit. Uh, I, the, the smartest explanation I got was that she probably didn't see anything particularly enlightening, that she essentially, you know... So, that the love between her and and Lucy was what was transcendent and that what she basically was seeing was those feelings of being loved and loving somebody and you know that's why we see the footage at the end of the movie and when she leans over to talk to the old lady she she she's basically getting her revenge on her there was enough of her left her identity left after this torment that she's endured um, she's a martyr, and so that's her job, is to witness this, to go through this ultimate form of suffering. But, you know, as a big fuck you to the lady, she basically says something to her along the lines of, you know, she she basically lets her know that what you're looking for is not what you think you're looking for. You know, that wow. the payoff is not what you were hoping it was. And, you know, whatever she does, she says it in a in a way that, you know, completely just defeats the old lady. So she just is ready to throw in the towel immediately. <laughs> I mean, that's that's about wow. as good an explanation as I can get. I mean, there's, you know, there's a bunch of different ways it could go. I mean, she could have just said, I didn't see anything, um, you know, but that didn't make any sense. I mean, you know, like the, it doesn't really matter, I guess, ultimately, because we don't know what she said. Um but we know that it wasn't what this woman was expecting to hear <laughs> because her reaction was not to go down and gloat to these people about how what the afterlife is like. Instead, her reaction was to blow her head off. Um, but she also made it explicit to Etienne that um, the girl was very clear about what was on the other side, that she, you know, it was, there was basically no uncertain terms about what she saw. So it's like, hmm, okay, what the, all right, sure, yeah, all right, hey, but you know, all right, hey. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to hardcore disagree with one thing that you said. Yeah. You said that she didn't gloat, and I disagree with that. I think this whole thing was her gloating. I think it doesn't matter what Anna said at all. All that mattered is that she said something and that Mademoiselle heard it and then conveyed to all of the very important people in on her scheme with her that she heard it and that she knew the answer, that the answer was hers, and then she did away with it so that all of those people wouldn't know. 
but would know that she knew as a big fuck you to all of them. That's quite so, possible. That's quite possible because yeah. in my mind, those were all a bunch of wealthy benefactors who were willing to torture people to try to get some sort of reassurance that the afterlife was there and that it was a wonderful thing. And, you know, the, even the old lady was like, fuck y'all, I got what I wanted. I got your money. Exactly. <laughs> I, I got your money and I got my answer and I'm Audi 5000. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, f yeah, there, there's so much there. I, I feel like, like you, you mentioned that, that Anna was love. I, I feel, and that, that Anna and Lucy were like opposite sides of the same coin. I feel like Mademoiselle was the third side of that mm -hmm. coin. I feel like Lucy was the embodiment of fear Anna was the embodiment of love, and I think Mademoiselle was the embodiment of greed. And so there are these, like, three facets of kind of the same thing. Maybe there's forgiveness somewhere in there? I'm not really sure. But, uh, yeah, it's it's fascinating. And I, I, think, I think the answer to the question, what what did Anna say to Mademoiselle doesn't matter nearly as much as the, the, the question itself. Mm -hmm. Like I, I think, I think trying to figure out what she said is almost pointless, but rather the idea is, is like the idea there is that all of these, the, the people that what she said, that, that the content of what she said matters to, are these wealthy people torturing people for the sake of getting to this thing that they don't even deserve? Like, I think that was what he was going through. I think in the same way that Mademoiselle was saying, fuck you to all of these people, I think perhaps a little bit Pascal was giving the, the fuck you to his audience. That's certainly possible. I mean, I, I, I think from interviews that I've read with him, that would certainly not be beyond him to do something like that. Um, he, yeah. he says that the movie is primarily about suffering, which, I mean, that's, you don't even really need to say that. I mean, it's pretty obvious that the movie's about suffering. It's, yeah. it's you know, and I think I liked, some. I read on, I think it was on Wikipedia, where somebody, one of the critics that reviewed the film had said that, you know, he believe, he thinks that the idea the idea behind the ending is kind of to implicate us as witnesses, so that we become martyrs by watching this whole process. You know, that we we are just this passive audience that you know allows all of this to happen in front of us. Which, yeah, maybe I don't know. I mean, it's possible. I don't know. I mean, it's not wrong. I just don't know that that was what he was. You know, like that's what Michael Hanukkah was trying to do with that fucking incredible movie uh uh oh god what the hell is it called where he that Dr dreidel 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 <laughs> yeah that's it where the that family goes on vacation up in the alps and they they basically are taken they are like taken hostage in their own home by these two young boys and then the rest of the film oh, is oh fuck yeah the two young boys tormenting them and putting them through oh. hell and constantly breaking the fourth wall and looking at us and implicating it's like us. strange game or something like that. Funny games. Funny games, yes. And and part of Hanukkah's intention there was was directly to implicate the audience as, you know, like how dare you sit here and watch this as if it's entertainment. You know, this family is lit I mean, this family's being tortured right before your eyes and you're just sitting here watching it like it's fun. And even the you know, like the character who's like the ringleader keeps looking at us and saying, you know, like Hey, isn't this fun or whatever? I mean, it's just you know, it's like it, it sounds cheesy. I mean, it kind of is, but it's it works so well in the context of that film because that film is fucking brutal. <laughs> yeah, yeah, man, wow. I had not put that movie and this together, but that is quite a connection, sir. <laughs> it's this wow. movie. We've talked about you know this this quote unquote movement called the new French extremity. It was, I don't think anybody that was lumped into that movement was necessarily, you know, identified with that. It was, it, I think it was more of a label placed on a series of films that came out around, you know, the early 2000s that were extreme as, and they were horror films. Yeah. They were, you know, presenting really uncomfortable subjects, um, 
in a very unflinching way, and that's not very common in French film, or it wasn't until then anyway. And suddenly, whatever was going on in French society, there was a group of directors that kind of were expressing similar all these similar feelings at the same time. And of, of course, you know, this, the film world looked at that as a movement, which it was, I guess. Um, yeah. And this film was definitely lumped into that. I mean, again, like, Laguier doesn't, he doesn't say that, well, yeah, I was, you know, I made this because of the new French extremity. It, it was just included in there. Um, yeah. But yeah, there was a lot of, there was a lot of fucked up shit coming out of Europe right around that time period. I mean, there was that, uh, was it Francois Ozon, that short film that we talked about? Was it By the Sea? I think it was called. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very dark. Oh, wow. Very, very yeah. dark. And then there was uh, Calvaire. Um, there was uh, there was a there was a handful of movies, and then oh, Inside the one about the pregnant mm-hmm. woman and all that stuff, and you know that's similar to oh, yeah. to By the Sea as well. I mean, it was just, that stuff was fucked up. Um, yeah, very the one where the husband and wife are being chased by kids. Oh yeah, them or something or whatever. Something like that. Yeah, yeah. like the the weird urban like demon children they're not they're not really demon children i mean they're just douchebags um <laughs> tormenting the husband and wife in this weird like super urban apartment building if i remember correctly wasn't it or is that oh no that's a different one Some, i don't i don't remember all of it it was very blue it, yeah. everything was very blue tinged because right. it was 2000 and something <laughs> that's right Where everything has to have a color <laughs> yeah <laughs> It was probably I'll bet I'll bet all that shit lined up perfectly with the come to daddy video from uh uh Aphex Twin. That fucking yeah. that is a very disturbing video. It really is. And what a jam too. Yeah, killer jam. <laughs> yeah. Well, come to daddy. <laughs> one of my favorite all time shots in the history of horror cinema is that bit in the video when that old lady comes face to face with that demon creature and it's screaming in her face so loud that her hair is being blown back and she's just standing there while that thing is like "Ah!" it's such a fucking amazing scene and it's just from a music video oh it's so good so good chris cunningham i think was it chris cunningham that made that video he made a bunch of great videos he made some videos for bjork and a bunch of bunch of other stuff we we talked about that guy's yeah his his videography. He's got good shit. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. martyrs. It's uh, yeah. I'm trying to think what else. I mean, it's there's so much to to All chew right. on. I've got one. Yes. All right. So so I think this movie also get, makes you question who the monster is mm-hmm. because we have several characters transitioning roles in here mm-hmm. between. Being the monster, being the victim. The movie even talks about the difference, like how easy it is to make a victim, but how it's almost impossible to make a martyr. So we've got we've got Lucy, who begins as a victim and then becomes a monster, mm-hmm. but is haunted by a monster. And then later we realize that the monster that was haunting her was also a victim. Mm-hmm. And and you know we've got we've got Anna, who is always in this middle state between monster and victim we could say that she's a monster for not believing lucy and for trying to rescue one of lucy's tormentors but of course she she is just this this like love deity um the whole time and then of course we have mademoiselle who is also almost almost transitioning not to victim but like i feel like her suicide at the end was its own attempt at becoming a martyr Mm -hmm. Or something I don't know, but there's a lot in there. I think the like it we're questioning who's a monster, who's a victim, what the what the difference is between those definitions, and perhaps maybe even Pascal Laugier was questioning if we are all in fact just victims. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's or monsters. Whoa, I, whoa. the thing. Yeah, I mean the the like I remember that's all. That's all. Those are all good points. I and. Yeah, like I don't really have anything to add to that. I was just thinking about fine. Yeah. thinking about like my experience of watching this movie, particularly like to say the first time I saw it, where uh, the, someone had recommended it to me, but they they were very 
careful to basically tell me nothing other than you have to watch this. Uh, I was like, what is it? It's a French horror film. What's it about? I can't tell you. You know, like you just have to watch it. So I did. And, you know, I'm so glad that she didn't tell me anything about it because it was fucking amazing. But yeah, that yeah. Apparently, the the genesis of the whole movie was this idea that he had in his mind of some person who shows up at the door of a normal everyday suburban family and kills them all for no apparent reason. That just he just had this image of her standing at the door. That how shocking it would appear on screen. He literally wrote yeah. the movie around that image. Damn, it was and it was definitely a high point in the movie. It was so disorienting because you see this family, you know nothing good is going to happen to them. It's not, this is, it's a horror film. It's not, you know, it's not like they're going to save the day and everybody's going to cuddle. And you know something bad is coming. Um, and I guess if you really stop to think about it, you might be able to kind of piece together that Lucy is probably going to do something to these people. But it all happens ab- so abruptly. I mean, there's just a ring at the door and the family's still talking and the dad is kind of like absentmindedly saying something as he heads over to the door and he opens the door and just boom, just gets blown away. And and then one by one. Yeah, and including the, the children who she's obviously tormented about but kills them anyway, you know? I mean, yeah, yeah. The mom dead straight out and then the son, she like has him sit down and questions him. He's like, she's like, how old are you? Do you know what your parents did? And that, that is a little masterful piece right there where he like, we, it seems like maybe he did in fact know what his parents did, but you can't really be sure, but it was good enough for her. <laughs> he, he had to have, I mean, he was what, 17, I think they said 18. He, he had to yeah. at least know something was going on. He probably didn't know that some poor girl was being tortured in their basement that, that he didn't know existed. But I'm sure they had all kinds of weird people coming and going in this house. And he probably won. But I don't know. I mean, I guess the mom and dad were the ones doing the torture. Because at the end of the movie, you know, when Anna's being tormented, she's being tormented by this couple that lives in the house. I, yeah, I love when the ladies like you see them upstairs, and the woman is preparing that schl- that glop, like like in a blender, yeah, that pea soup smoothie or whatever the fuck it is. And there's like <laughs> there's just like this bowl of fruit on the counter, like that kind of thing that people do to show like, you see, we can afford delicious fruit, and it's beautiful and makes our house look nice because we have a nice life where we are yeah. torturing some girl against her will for a possible idea. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah. Don't worry, this movie is not about class. No, not even a little <laughs> bit. <laughs> no, no thought to the bourgeoisie or the the upper class or the wealthy victimizing the the unwealthy. For, no, no, I don't think Pascal had that going on in his brain. Nope, nope, not at all. No. One of the things that I that was a good touch, of course, was that there's no sexual... Sex has nothing to do with the torture. This is not about, you know, we're... This is a... This is a level of torment and that, that transcends crime. It's just... Yeah. It's just horrible. Yeah. Yeah, there, there was no... The torturers were not gratified. Don't you worry. There was no rap. (laughs) They're just, and and they're so, they're so, it's so mundane to them. Like they're just doing their jobs basically, you know, which is, which is weird. It was also interesting that they were basically interchangeable. Like we never actually get a straightforward answer that the the husband and wife that she killed was the same couple that had been torturing her because she even says they look different you know that the, their faces have changed but it's mm. the same people and then she killed and she's killed them and then they are just replaced with two other anonymous husband and wife people yeah that's true yeah it's yeah it's it's so incredibly fucked up <laughs> Yes. That there's this weird underground French society of people who have bought into this idea that this woman has come up with that, you know, through through suffering and a form of martyrization, we can find the secrets to the afterlife. And that 
this goal is so important that it's it transcends the uh, the their victims uh freedom you know like their 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 own lives mean nothing anymore they they simply exist just to satisfy this answer this question possibly <laughs> yeah you don't even you know that it's basically on, based on a hunch that this woman has she doesn't you know and and she there's obviously some evidence to support what she suspects but there's no you know they've already done it to what did they say four people before or something like that <laughs> Those were just the ones that have made it to the martyr state. Oh, that's right. Yeah. There were yeah. probably many others who died long before then. Exactly. Or not long enough. Uh, so yeah, there were yeah, yeah. there were four there that were. had reached the martyr state, but they never uh communicated anything. Said the things. Yeah, yeah, they remained catatonic or whatever. Um But this girl, you know, managed to pull herself back from whatever precipice she went over and just enough to fuck the old lady and then <laughs> went back into her yeah. blue box space plan nightmare. I don't know what the <laughs> fuck. Yeah. Yeah. Jello space. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. So also we haven't, we haven't really praised it, but God damn the practical makeup effects in this movie are splendid yeah. there is there is this scene where where when anna rescues the the tortured victim underneath and she you you mentioned it she has this metal plate that that just cut like a like a metal wide wo mohawk covering the middle of her face all the way to the back of her head and it is stapled into her skull and lucy has to p pluck out the staples and each one hurts and then she peels off the metal plate and there's just this goopy layer of human slime that comes off with the metal plate. It's so revolting and top notch. Oh my God. It's like all the pus and blood and horrible shit that leaked out of the staple holes stuck underneath <laughs> this thing. Cause it's tight. It's, it's, I mean, it's, the staples are huge. They're like, big yeah. industrial yeah, they aren't staples they're like clips metal clips yeah and and anna has to like stick the head of a flathead big flathead screwdriver underneath and pry these fucking things out while the girl is just screaming bloody murder and, and she does it with what four of them yeah <laughs> and then she peels this fucking thing off and it's just like oh this muck and goop oh <laughs> It's amazing. It's amazing. Oh, it's so gross. <laughs> oh. oh, I was so happy and terrified. <laughs> it's like, oh no. Oh no, it's worse than I thought it would be. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah, this this movie it's is one of the It's it's unrelenting. Yeah, yeah. 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 It's it's one of the least disappointing because like they're like horror movies will present you like here's an opportunity for an effect to to kick ass and oftentimes it doesn't kick ass as much as it could be It'd be like ooh what's underneath there oh okay that's fine but this one is like ooh what's underneath there and then it's like oh my god no no why why <laughs> it's the inside of a gummy tomato <laughs> it's fucking horrible. <laughs> just the worst uh, best it, best amazing this movie oh. yeah this movie does a, a very good job of reminding you um how visceral a response we have to what's inside our bodies like yeah you know outside there's there's sexuality there's shame there's you know humiliation there's uh trying to impress people there's all these you know there's we dress certain ways we trim our body hair for you know we do we have surgery we do all these things to appear a certain way on the outside but yeah the second you cut into somebody and open their body the interior of their body is immediately nauseating you know the, <laughs> that's overwhelmingly the response that most people are going to have is revulsion There's, for yeah. whatever reason you know it's wired into us i guess because it's you know because you can die if you get cut into 
that you know well yeah and like the uh, you know if you're if you could be eaten by a giant monster and you see the inside of a human body wherever you are you need to not be there yeah i mean you were hot wired to be you know to be repelled by that repulsed by it and so it's kind of like the ultimate jump scare it's gonna work every time you know like you're yeah you can become numb to that stuff to a certain extent but i mean Ultimately, you know, God knows how many horror films I've seen. It's it's still shocking to me when it's presented in a certain way, you know. Um, yeah. Like, like for instance, in this movie. Um, yeah. And, like, the makeup, you know, we see when he begins to cut into her body, we just see her facial reaction, which is incredibly traumatizing. Um, she doesn't even make any noise, if I remember correctly. She just exhibits... A, a level of pain that you can't even imagine because he's basically probably cutting up the the back of her, you know, flesh like she's mm-hmm. wearing a bodysuit. The next time we see her, she's completely splayed. I mean, flayed. Yeah. yeah splayed too, but yeah. completely flayed. Like they, and the makeup is amazing because it's so good. I mean, it's obviously, you know, she's wearing some kind of a suit, but it doesn't, it's, it, it doesn't, doesn't look suity. I mean, it, you know, she, no. It looks amazing. The only flesh that's left as far as, like, surface um, is her face. <laughs> yeah. And everything else yeah. is, is all hell razory goopy and just veins and nerves, Ugh. muscle tissue. And, oh. and when he drapes that sheet over her, 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 oh, over her body with all of her nerve endings exposed, it's just like, oh, God, that has to be the most painful sheet ever. And the, and the movie forces you to have to think, to, you know, you're empathizing with this character. So you, you're you now seeing the result of a, of a man who literally cut all of her flesh off and she was not anesthetized. She was not, you know, not only that, but she had been beaten into this like near catatonic state to where she, was, yeah. she wasn't even fighting back. That was the whole point was to get her to a state where... She was completely passive, you know. She, yeah. She was so passive that she even seemed to show affection for the woman, um, you know, right before they took her into the <laughs> ring of doom. <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> the skinning ring. <laughs> oh man. Oh god. I mean, so he did he have some image in his mind, like. You know what we need? We need to have um, a welding team put together a skinning ring apparatus, uh, which the sole purpose of which is to hold someone still while they are flayed. <laughs> oh, damn. I mean, I, I mean, he's from France. I'm pretty sure that apparatus already existed during, you know, some stuff that was going on next door. He probably went to the sex shop and picked one up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Le kink de gravity. <laughs> he probably had it in his garage. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. He made it out of spare bicycle parts. He's like, hey, honey, do I still have that flare? <laughs> do we still have Grandpa's old flare? <laughs> we still have the skin wheel? <laughs> Jesus. Oh, yes, it is in our rough hewn stone leaky basement. <laughs> Jesus fucking Christ. <sighs> I want to I want to bring up the topic and it's something that we've talked about before. We don't hate the idea of them in general. In general they are okay, but this is an example of maybe one that didn't need to. Let's talk about remaking movies. Oh my god. Yes. That's <laughs> that's a subject that has come up on on our show several times of course because, you know, for one thing we've covered a bunch of remakes. Um yeah. And and there's there's always going to be a running back and forth in, you know, in the world of people who like movies as to whether or not remakes are a good idea. Or if you've got your camp that says that they should absolutely never be made, that there's no point, just make something new. Come on. You know, then there's yeah. people like us that are kind of like, I mean, you made it. I guess I'll watch it. Um, you know, and we're, <laughs> we're perfectly willing to accept those movies on their own merit. And recognize that they are secondary to the original, and but that it is possible for somebody to make a superior remake. That you know that yeah. that can happen as well. 
primarily that's not going to be the case. But um, then you get to this movie, <laughs> where someone in Hollywood thought this is going to be a banger. Blumhouse. Blumhouse. And so I, I never, I have not watched it because I just, oh, I just, I should have watched it in prep for the show. And now I'm probably going to watch it as soon as we're done. But, um, oh, I know it's terrible. I mean, you've told me about how awful it is. Okay. So it's, oh man, you have it. Is it, is it not I, awful? I kind of want to pick it for the next thing we watch. Oh, that would now, be interesting. That would be interesting. I don't think it would be interesting because <laughs> we we we've run into this with remakes before, where like 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 we just did this with um with the uh the Virgin Spring and then Last House on the Left, where it gets exhausting just saying the same story over and over again. Yeah. And that's one of the things that I really liked about the difference between the Virgin Spring and Last House on the Left is that the Last House, Last House on the Left wasn't a remake, it was an adaptation. Yeah. And that's something that I think would is especially important with whenever you are you're you're like porting a movie from foreign lands over to America, I think it's important for it to either be, it, it needs to either be like a classic that you're remaking for a new audience or a reimagining for an American audience. Whereas this is one of those where it's just like, well, people won't watch it because it's in French, so let's make it in English. And so they they all they do is they change little things to to make it more American instead of of making it a new vision. It's just an Americanification of the original. And so it's it's so much like the original that there's no point in watching it mm. except <clears throat> that they they Americaned it a little in a way that makes it not as good, mm -hmm. you know? Like, like they, they didn't try to make a movie that's just as good as the original. They they made it where, like, they hit all the same notes, but they, they like, well, we're gonna, we're gonna soften up the family murder, we're gonna soften up the, the torture sequences, and we're gonna change out who does what a little bit so that at the end someone is the surviving hero and that's everything you need to know about the movie instead of watching it it's it's not shitty if it was its own movie but the fact that it was like just a few years it, it was like less than 10 years after this movie came yeah. out and it was just for the sake of making an American version for an American audience. And they Blumhoused it. You know, they didn't shy away from everything as much as they could have, mm -hmm. but they did shy away from things. And, and it's just, it's just a little bit shitty. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, it, it, I don't think it was, you know, didn't make any money. I don't think, I don't, I don't think they managed uh, to even do I'm that. sure it, I'm sure it made money maybe it I'm did. sure like that, that that's the thing with horror movies is you can make horror movies for cheap and and there's enough of an audience that every single one will make money not like a ridiculous right. it, it's not gonna make you wealthy but it helps the bottom line like you will turn a profit on a horror movie yeah yeah that's true <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's so that's why they keep making them yeah yeah I mean it, yeah that's true they're cheap to make and you know they, they, they aren't that hard to make money with, especially with, like, the after-theater market and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So, so yeah. Martyrs, the remake, it's it, it wouldn't be interesting to go over. It would literally just be frustrating. It'd be like, okay, here's some things that are exactly the same, and here are some things that are frustratingly different, and you can all see how this culminates into no actual original artistic vision was had in the making of this film. Wow. That's, yeah, that's pretty lame. I There's a scene and there's, yes. or there's a shot in the trailer that always throws me. And I'm like, every time I see the, the cross, the crucifixes with the like candle lit, I'm just like, Nope, Nope. That is, nope. that has nothing to do with the first movie. Why is that shit in this one? Yeah. 
Yeah. They were like, all right, so let's uh, let's recast the girls as hotter titty ladies and uh, and make it a complete masturbation experience. <laughs> hotter titty ladies. <laughs> yeah. It's funny you say that because that's going to be the name of the movie I'm making. It's called Hotter Titty Ladies. <laughs> Hunter Titty Ladies 2, but there was never an original. There is no one. <laughs> the two's not about that, man. <laughs> Hot, Hotter Titty, titty Ladies. Hotter Titty Ladies. It's all one word. Hotter Titty Ladies. Have you guys seen Hotter Titty Ladies? Yeah. Two? <laughs> the Hotter Titty Ladies 2, my punk rock band. <laughs> Hotter titty ladies. Yeah, yeah. It's it's very intellectual movie commentary. <laughs> oh my god. I found I found this article online yesterday about the daughter of the singer Patsy Klein, the the, the oh. country singer or whatever. Um her, yeah. her daughter's name is Julie, and uh her, her mother had remarried when Julie was born. She her mother was remarried. So she took on that person's name. Then her daughter grew up and married someone on her own and added that name to the end. So um, Julie Klein, I'm assuming that was her born name. Anyways, Julie Klein is now known as Julie Dick Fudge. <laughs> or no, Julie Fudge Dick. Sorry, Julie Fudge Dick. Fudge Dick! <laughs> so I posted this, this and I'm like, wow. And... uh a friend of mine said something like, "I wonder if she's if she uh, is familiar with Julie Cock Chocolate." <laughs> I just came apart. I was like, "Fucking Julie Cock Chocolate!" Oh my god! Whoa, <laughs> Julie Fudge Damn. Dick. Why would you? Oh my god! Fudge Dick. Uh, I, I don't remember what her last name actually is but go out there and look up olivia wilde's pre-stage name and you'll have a good job oh really nice yeah. i didn't know yeah. that oh that's fantastic i don't i don't remember what it is and i'm not gonna look it up right now but it's a funny one <laughs> apparently there's like whole lists out there of celebrity real names that you can watch and it's like oh yeah i see why <laughs> i see why it's natalie portman now <laughs> When it was like Elron Manischewitz or something. <laughs> that is a good name! <laughs> oh my god. Whoa! They're like, yeah, you got the goods. You're, you, you've you clearly got talent. You're, you're a beautiful young lady. But um, the name. Can we talk about the name? <laughs> Elron. Elron Manischewitz. <laughs> Whoa! <laughs> We uh, yeah. okay. Uh, what can I say? My parents were in love. Yeah. <laughs> uh. She was an elf from Rivendell, <laughs> and he had fled Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> he had fled. <sighs> <coughs> oh. Woo. Oh, I'm suffocating. Oh. That's good. It's good. Oh. Oh, John, John, what did you watch or or what other media did you consume most recently? <laughs> I uh I watched uh Oddity, which was the uh follow up yeah. to caveat from uh Chichi McCarthy or whatever his name was. Um Yeah, Grady O'Kingery or <laughs> yeah, something. That's it. Coco yeah. O'Shanna Flark. Um, <laughs> oh, Coco! I, I pretty much hated Oddity. I thought it was fairly terrible. Um, Let me say, without a shadow of a doubt, fuck Oddity. <laughs> that movie sucks. It was not good. You're right, it was terrible. What a... What a horrible main character, too. Just like, oh, yes, I'm the gray-haired blind psychic lady. Hmm. Who has a <laughs> creature from the Black Lagoon thing in a chest. I was like, yeah, yeah. Let, let me retrieve my sex doll. That it made, Yeah, that movie sucked ass. Um, yeah. 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 
Um, yeah. I saw a, a movie called Hold Your Breath on Hulu uh, with Sarah Paulson. Um, is that good? It's pretty good. It's it's kind of slow paced, but it's uh, it's it's worth a watch. I enjoyed it. Um, nice. Yeah. It uh, it reminded me of another movie, but I I forget what that movie is, so I won't even go into it. But it's kind it's kind of like its uh, own the, little subgenre at this point. The like planes one where the lady's like in a house alone yeah. on the planes, and there's like wind or yeah, some shit. Yeah. That one. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, and it kind of reminded me of Hagazusa. You know, like we talked about what would be the American oh, nice. version of Hagazusa. Well, apparently it's Hold Your Breath. Uh, <laughs> oh, nice. Um, I watched the, the Salem's Lot uh, remake that came out on Max. It, it was okay. Nice. It was... Nice. It wasn't great. Um, and then last night I watched Daddy's Head, which just came well, out. Well, shut your whore mouth. Oh, are you picking this one? Oh, no, don't say. I was... Okay, I won't say. Okay, I, I, I liked it a lot. I'll just say that. Okay, nice. <laughs> it's uh, yeah. I'm not gonna. I'm not even gonna talk about it. What uh, that as far as horror, that was <laughs> horror media. That was basically what I consumed. A bunch of audio books, of course, but whatever. Um, how about yourself, sir? I have not had a chance to watch very much horror movie lately. Talking good, I do. Ah. Uh, but I did watch the first half of VHS Beyond mm. before Melanie came home from work and I had to turn it off. <laughs> and uh, I'll say it was pretty good from what I saw of it. Uh, when I ended, some people had uh, fallen out of a plane and were dealing with what would come next. And so I'm looking forward to find out finding out more about that. Is that the, is that the newest? Like it just came out or something? Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. it's the new one because apparently, apparently, Shutter bought the VHS franchise, and they're j now just like let's let's churn these bad boys out. Okay, well, I mean that's fine as yeah. long as they're good. <laughs> yeah, apparently, one of the segments in there was written by Mike Flanagan and directed by Mike Flanagan's wife, which I hope to one day know her name instead of referring to her as Mike Flanagan's wife. <laughs> She's a fine, fine actress and a lovely lady. Good, good choice, Mike. <laughs> I'd like to introduce you to my wife. Her name is Mike Flanagan's wife. <laughs> we call her MFW. <laughs> oh, man. She's one of those actresses that I always interchange with other actresses, including fucking... Uh, the one that, that is also in The Fall of the House of Usher that plays the demon... Uh, I forget her name, Ooh. but I I tend to kind of interchange those women's faces somewhat. So when I when I was first seeing the trailers <laughs> for the you know that movie, I was just like, wait, are they playing the same? I'm so lost. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> so wait, one of the he's married to one of the actors in in Follow House of Usher, in the, the, in, the gray haired the gray haired sister in the Usher family. Yes. Remember, she's like the wise ass. She's always smoking cigarettes, and she has like the gray. <sighs> gray hair um like silver but she's in all of his shit right yeah 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 is she the one who was in uh she was like the deaf lady in the house in, that the guy was in hush that's her that's her yeah yeah nice yeah. okay yeah yeah he definitely has a type and he's like i'm going to cast other actresses that kind of look like her i don't know why I can't. I just think she's a good actor. I can't believe I can't remember the other actress's name because I've been, you know, a fan of hers for a long time. I mean, she was in. Uh, she's been in a whole bunch of stuff forever, and she's hooked up with the whole Flanagan crew, and she's been in a bunch of his things and made them all better, as far as I can tell. Uh, nice. She's great in the yeah, fall. You're of just the house an asshole. Her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyways, yeah. <laughs> We can't remember female people's names. It's bad. Good lord. It's so sad. I also tried reading uh, The Gunslinger by Stephen King. Uh -huh. the, uh, the first book in the fucking thing of stuff that everyone... Everyone... Because like, I've always bounced off Stephen King's books of, of reading his books. Every time mm -hmm. I've tried, I've been like, I hate this. <laughs> and so they're like, oh, you're just, you're, you're just reading the wrong one. You know what you should read? You should read The Gunslinger. And so I finally did it. I, I picked up a copy and I started reading it. And as soon, which I can tell you, it's very soon, as soon as I got to the point where it's like, he was a rugged desert man 
tromping through the desert looking for a another guy who's in the desert but is better at traversing deserts than this desert guy is at deserting and i'm just like wow i do not care and i, I was just done with it it also flashed the trailer to the gunslinger movie to me where it's just all about these two cat and mouse guys and i was like i am not looking forward to anything to do with any of this so i just put it down and went back to my life yeah that <clears throat> the little i know about that whole series of books i just they just don't appeal to me at all and i'm not yeah. like stephen king but i did just and maybe i would like those books but i'll never know because i ain't reading them <laughs> Yeah, it's it's I don't know. I'll watch I'll watch the Mike Flanagan adaptation. Yeah. Maybe it'll be good. Yeah. But uh whew, I don't know, man. So, I don't know. So his wife's name is Kate Siegel. And um, Oh yeah. And then the other actress is Carla Gugino. Oh yeah, of course. <laughs> I love Carla Cucchino. I do. She's a great actor. She yeah. is. She's awesome. And, and Kate Siegel, too. Yeah. They're good. Yeah. 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 Great. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's fine. Whatever. Uh, I also was watching Uzumaki, and uh, oh, it's, yeah. I was going to pick that instead. Yeah. I was... Uh, but... Um, but then what happened with it has now been revealed, and uh, it really, really sucks. Oh, really? So uh, I don't want to go with that. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. Uh, if you, if you, eventually you'll come across an article reading about what happened with Uzumaki, and it's just such a bummer. Really? Um, yeah, yeah, I know, I know. It's uh, whew, you'll, uh, it's not good. So yeah, fuck American anime production companies. Uh, fuck you, fuck you, fuck you. Mm -hmm. um, and we won't go with that. Plus, there's the problem of the final episode not coming out until the night before we're supposed to right. record. So that isn't super convenient. So so instead, I went with a movie that is so brand new that John couldn't possibly have already watched it <laughs> last night. <laughs> Oh, oh, really? What what movie would that be? It's it's called Daddy's Head. <laughs> <laughs> it's directed by Benjamin Barfoot. It is it is in no way like the Baba Duke at all. <laughs> nope, not at, at, not yeah. even a little bit. No, nope, but we're going to John and I watch it. One, two, maybe three more times each, who can say? And two weeks from now, we will tell you all about it. And by then, John will have seen it instead of right now when he hasn't seen it yet. Haven't seen it. Uh, but but based on my <laughs> intuition, I'm pretty sure that Ramon might be able to watch this one. Yeah. Uh, uh, an animal is harmed. So, yeah. watch out for that. That's true. Not actually. The actual animal is fine, but harm coming to animals is depicted a little bit more explicitly than you would get in most movies not set in the Australian outback. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Exactly. There, There is yeah. that. Yeah. And then there's, you know, m more, like, typical horror movie fair type stuff. Not the movie itself, but as far as, like, content. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of good, or, well, I, I can't say good. There's a lot of stuff to cover. So join us when we talk about that, and we'll also see if either of us can remember where that knife was the whole time. Who can say? That, but I'll tell you who can say. It's us two weeks from now when you join us to listen to this high-quality podcast of two very smart people saying words that you want to hear. So, <laughs> that's right. So tune in in two weeks, and we're gonna tear down Daddy's head. I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Let's see. yeah it's a Ronald Reagan. That's, mm. I get it. That's mm. that's solid. Mm. Yeah. So you know, don't, don't forget to get in touch. Uh, you know, let us know how much you hate our show, and yeah, how, how much you hate us. And yeah, you should recommend movies for us to watch, and then we won't. Yes, that we uh, yeah, we'll be all over that. Uh, <laughs> especially if you're from where we get most of our audience, uh, Algeria, uh, <laughs> Sweden, I believe yeah. was was one of them. 
We get a lot from Sweden. We're we're real big over there. <laughs> Swedes and Algerians. Oh man, killing it. You, you, you gotta play to your audience. <laughs> <laughs> so tune in when that uh, that's going to happen. So in the yeah. meantime, um, in the words of Pascal Logier. <laughs>